I'd like to now turn this over to Force Family Office's CEO, Stephen Saltstein. Thank you. Thank you, Callie. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. We greatly appreciate you taking time out of your day to be with us. Um, you know, I, I am happy to tell you that uh, I, I have asked Jim to compensate us uh, completely in stock. And uh, really the reason for that is because I believe in Jim. I believe in his ability to execute. Uh, his experience uh, of doing it before. Uh, he has absolutely proven himself to be a person of integrity and a person who does what he says he's going to do. And I really think that he can make this a huge home run. So with that said, it is my great pleasure to introduce Jim Joyce, um, CEO of SIGIN. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Stephen. I appreciate the kind words. Uh, let me share my screen here. All right. I appreciate everyone's participation today. Um, as you will see, the title of the slide is Calming the Storm. This is our strategy to address life-threatening cytokine storm syndromes, and it's associated with a broad spectrum of bacterial and viral pathogens. Uh, before I get into that, I want you to review our forward-looking statements. Uh, these statements are also available on our website, SeganTherapeutics.com, as well as at SEC.com or I'm sorry, sec.gov. So with that said, let me give you a little bit of uh, background on our experience and how it's relevant to addressing cytokine storm and bacterial and viral pathogens. Uh, my co-founder, Craig Roberts, he developed a system called the Hemolife Impact System, which was approved in 22 countries. This is a blood purification technology to treat life-threatening inflammatory conditions that are precipitated by the cytokine storm. Myself, I have two decades of public company CEO experience and board leadership roles. Uh, and in this regard, specific to our current endeavors, I'm the founder of Athlon Medical and oversaw the development of the Athlon Hemopurifier, which was the first in industry broad spectrum antiviral countermeasure device. Uh, that was the first and only therapy to receive two breakthrough device designations from FDA and approved under emergency use authorization provisions in Health Canada, the United States, and, and by the government of Germany to treat Ebola. Uh, also named as one of the, during my tenure, one of the top 10 advances in healthcare by Time Magazine, and one of the top 25 inventions. So between myself and Craig, we have some experience in this area. And I wanna start off and talk about the actual problem associated with the cytokine storm that's induced by bacterial and viral infections. If you're not familiar with the cytokine storm, it's a response to an infection. Uh, in response to infection, your body produces inflammatory cytokines. Unfortunately, sometimes the body goes into overdrive as referenced in the slide and overproduces cytokines, which can damage tissues, organs, and, and lead to death. Uh, this is called the cytokine storm, but it's a little more complex than this because it's just not the misfortune of somebody's immune system over responding. Uh, there's a multifactorial process involved, and, and this includes uh, bacterial endotoxins that reside in our bodies uh, as part of our intestinal flora. And in response to infection, again, the natural response is to create uh, inflammatory cytokines to combat infection. This creates a permeability in the intestines. And perhaps some of you have heard of leaky gut syndrome, but essentially it allows for intestinal flora, bacterial flora to move into the circulatory system. And for those that have high levels of endotoxin, this endotoxin moves into the circulatory system, and it is known to be, through, through multitude of peer-reviewed publications, known to be uh, one of the most significant drivers of sepsis. So it's a combination of events that can lead to this cytokine storm that causes tissue damage, multiple organ failure, and can lead to death. Uh, during the COVID-19 outbreak, the cytokine storm was a leading cause of death and severe infections and the cytokine storm is known to precipitate sepsis, which is the number one cause of hospital deaths. And in the United States, accounts for a financial burden of more than $20 billion each year. 
In response, we developed Segan therapy. And this is an extracorporeal blood purification system. We designed Segan therapy to work on the global infrastructure of dialysis and CRRT machines already in hospitals and clinics. It utilizes standard blood tubing sets. It's a single blood in, blood out disposable cartridge. Uh, and it's designed in a manner where we've made it very scalable. I want to talk about the innovative design and unprecedented capabilities of this device. The device addresses pathogen sources of inflammation in concert with the broad spectrum reduction of inflammatory cytokines and other mediators. Within the device, we incorporate a cocktail of absorbent components that provide us with 200,000 square meters of surface area for which we can bind or absorb our therapeutic targets. Uh, and to put this in perspective, that's the equivalent in one device of approximately 50 acres of therapeutic absorption. Again, we think that's unprecedented. Uh, another point that is, is quite critical to understanding the relevance of this technology is that we eliminate our targets from the bloodstream during treatment. And you'll see on this slide versus concentration of targets. This let me simply point out that a majority of the other blood purification mechanisms are actually concentrating their targets in the circulatory system where they can continue to interact with blood cells. And we designed Segan therapy to be able to separate our targets away from blood cells and have them captured so that that interaction discontinues. If you're concentrating your targets in the circulatory system, they're still in the circulatory system to interact with blood cells that are, that are working to deliver oxygen to the lungs and working to combat infection. And you do not, in our viewpoint, want to be able to concentrate targets so they continue to interact with your blood cells. So this is a very important mechanism of action that we think is quite innovative. Other point is that we are a medical device. Uh, we move forward in our regulatory programs through CDRH uh, and our regulatory pathway is that of a feasibility study, the equivalent of a safety study uh, or a phase one drug study, uh, which then gives us the pathway to move into pivotal studies for large market indications uh, which are the equivalent of a phase three drug study. As you might know, uh, the patient populations for clinical studies are, are much less significant than the requirements for drugs. And we are designing a regulatory pathway to be modular where the IDE we're getting ready to submit to FDA related to initiation of human studies. We expect that safety study or feasibility study to be modular in the sense that it'll allow us to bridge into multiple pivotal study indications. So I wanna talk about some recent clinical milestones. We locked in the final design of Segan therapy uh, in recent months. Uh, and this, this is primarily associated with optimizing the cocktail of absorbent components that we incorporate in the device. We expanded our intellectual property based on new discoveries. This was primarily driven by unexpected abilities to capture a broad spectrum of viral pathogens. Uh, we've established and demonstrated our capability to manufacture our product through uh, protocols, which we think are transferable to GMP procedures. Uh, we completed our first animal pilot studies. We reported on one completion of animal pilot studies. And then we've also completed uh, another animal pilot study that incorporated uh, larger quantities of our absorbent components. And these studies went perfectly. Uh, and most important, in less than a year, uh, we completed six in vitro human blood studies that allowed us to validate 13 different relevant targets. And among these uh, is the ability to simultaneously address endotoxin and inflammatory cytokines from human blood. And this we disclosed, this was our first disclosure uh, in December 1st of last year. And, and let me tell you why this is important. Uh, there are two products that are long established in the industry for addressing life-threatening inflammatory conditions. One addresses inflammatory cytokines. Uh, the other addresses endotoxin. They do not address both of these targets. Uh, 
we demonstrated in this study the ability to remove bacterial endotoxin from human blood plasma, in addition to addressing interleukin-1 beta, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and interleukin-6, which are extremely relevant pro-inflammatory cytokines. So our first objective was to demonstrate that we have capabilities beyond products that have been currently used in the marketplace. The next report uh, was on January 6th of last year. We demonstrated the ability through a model study to address inflammatory cytovesicles. And, and these are large microvesicular particles that are transporting cytokine cargos and other inflammatory mediators through the bloodstream. And these have not previously been addressed with either a device or a drug therapy. And we think these are extremely relevant targets in the treatment of life-threatening inflammatory conditions. We followed up in April with a disclosure uh, of the ability to address both RNA and DNA viruses. And as part of this study, we demonstrated the ability to, to address the SARS coronavirus. We then moved into studies related to the removal of hepatic encephalopathy toxins. These are toxins that start building up in the bloodstream that lead to excessive inflammation uh, as a result in many cases of cirrhosis, but the failure of the liver to be able to remove these toxins. And I'll talk a little bit more about this, but we first demonstrated the ability to remove ammonia and bilirubin, and then followed up with an additional disclosure uh, of being able to remove bile acids. And those are the three primary hepatic toxins that are problematic in these patients, which in many cases can cause them to become comatose. And then we're going to report um, in the coming days, uh, we just haven't assembled the report yet, our report on gram positive bacterial toxin capture. Uh, and when I say gram positive, these are toxins that represent a large population of bacterial infections, many of which uh, are drug resistant to antibiotics. The bacterial endotoxin that we've already validated, those are gram negative, that's the gram negative bacterial toxin. So with the gram positive bacterial toxin study under our belt, we will have the ability to reference the full spectrum capability to address uh, bacterial uh, species, many of which uh, are becoming or have been resistant to antibiotic therapy. So if, if you're asking for a comparable point of reference, this is really quite simple. We knew when we established ourselves as a public company that for the first year, we'd be very focused on running our clinical endeavors. Uh, we'd be operating uh, kind of below the radar, but we also recognized that we had a very good comparable in the marketplace. And this is the team at Site Absorbance. I've known this team, I think I've known every CEO since its inception. Uh, and we participated together in a five-year program to treat sepsis and wounded war fighters as part of a Department of Defense DARPA program. But their product is called the Site Absorbent device, and it incorporates a single absorbent, whereas we incorporate a cocktail of absorbent components to, to optimize our capability to address our targets. The Cytosorb device addresses cytokines and small toxins generally below five nanometers in size, whereas we're able to address cytokines, toxins, viral pathogens, bacterial toxins, and cytovesicles that are below 200 nanometers in size based on our design. Uh, the surface adsorption area of the Cytosorb device is referenced at about 45,000 square meters. Our adsorption area is referenced as, we, as we've presented at approximately 200,000 square meters of adsorption area or 50 acres of therapeutic adsorption. Uh, Cytosorbance currently has a market cap of about 270 million. This is significantly down. The market cap has been in the 400 to 500 range uh, earlier this year and again, uh, we're still in a stage where we're preparing to, to build value. Now, I want to talk about lead indications. These represent some of the most significant unmet needs in global health. They're not well addressed with drug uh, therapies, and they're not well addressed with device therapies. And in each case, 
Uh, the cytokine storm underlies these conditions. And every one of these conditions is what we would call a pathogen associated inflammatory disorder. This includes community acquired pneumonia, hepatic encephalopathy, and emerging bioterror and pandemic threats. So first I wanna talk about community acquired pneumonia. Uh, and I'm going to share some statistics that, that might be quite surprising. Uh, this is a condition that's the leading cause of death globally among infectious diseases. And 97% of cases are induced by either a viral or bacterial infection. And this condition, community-acquired pneumonia, is actually the catalyst for 50% of sepsis and septic shock cases. And it's also a leading cause for acute respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, but it's important to recognize this is the indication, community-acquired pneumonia is the actual indication that people get coded for when they're, when they're admitted to the hospital. They don't get coded for ARDS or sepsis. This is the condition they get coded for. And the best way we know how to reduce the incidence of sepsis, septic shock, ARDS, is to be able to actually treat in advance of those, of those events occurring. Uh, CAP, it's also the leading cause of death in children under five years of age, leading cause of hospitalizations in the United States, 1.5 million individuals uh, among adults each year uh, admitted to the hospital with an annual financial burden that exceeds $10 billion. And the last point is the pathogen source of infection is only identified in about 38% of cases. And, and I want you to think about uh, you have somebody that has a life-threatening inflammatory condition driven by a, vir a viral or bacterial pathogen, but yet it has not yet been identified at admission. So in many cases, physicians empirically administer antibiotic therapy, not knowing whether or not there's a bacterial infection. And, and generally, only if, of that 38%, only 14% of those identif identified pathogens are bacterial. Most of them are, are viral in nature. So with our device, we like the fact that we can address both the viral pathogens, bacterial toxins. And what this means is that you can administer a therapy even prior to identification of what the pathogen source is. And then simultaneously with dealing with the pathogen sources, address the inflammatory cytokines and other mediators that are fueling that are fueling the cytokine storm. Now, hepatic encephalopathy, this is an acute life-threatening condition related to liver failure. This is a pathogen associated inflammatory and neurological disorder uh, whose hallmarks include the accumulation of hepatic toxins, and I mentioned these earlier, but essentially somebody that has liver failure, their liver is not uh, successfully eliminating these toxins. They start accumulating in the circulatory system, which creates a hyperinflammatory response, which then results in uh, a leaky gut syndrome or permeability in the gut, which allows endotoxin uh, to further trigger an immune response or an excessive immune response. Uh, and by doing all of this, the permeability of the blood-brain barrier is also increased and it allows these toxins to move through the blood-brain barrier and into the brain. And in stage three and four patients, uh, these patients at stage four, they're comatose, clinically defined as comatose. Uh, and at stage three, they're, they're very sick and the mortality rate is quite high and there's not a mechanism to be able to reverse this condition in place. Now, I will tell you, we have an advantage with this indication as it relates to our review team at, at FDA. And that's because my co-founder, Craig Roberts and his previous uh, technology at Hemolife, they advanced the impact system in a feasibility study that was extremely successful in this patient population. And these were patients that had to fail standard of care therapy uh, for 72 hours before they were admitted. In some cases were in coma, comas. Uh, and based on the outcomes and being able to treat these patients and reverse their condition, which included in all of the patients, they, they were revived or they started speaking again uh, during first treatment. It, it led to FDA to 
uh, stopped the study early to allow the company to prepare for a, a pivotal a study. And so it went extremely well. And so our FDA review team has previously seen that this condition can be reversed with an extracorporeal blood purification technology. In regards to incidents, uh, there's about 200,000 cases reported in 2018. The three-year survival rate, uh, once you've had your first incident of hepatic encephalopathy is about 15%. And for those that have cirrhosis of the liver, uh, the incidence is quite high, approximately 50%. And in our case, we have a solution to simultaneously address the hepatic toxins, the bacterial endotoxins, inflammatory cytokines, and mediators. Uh, and in combination, we think this strategy uh, will be successful in being able to uh, extend the life uh, or bridge these patients to liver transplants. The next area is emerging bioterror and pandemic threats. Uh, this is an area where I have quite a bit of experience. Uh, a number of years ago, I testified before Congress related to the use of medical devices. Uh, this was an effort to expand the definition of treatment countermeasure for bioterror and pandemic threats to be inclusive of medical devices, which at the time, the definition was solely, uh, solely reliant on drugs and vaccines, uh, and we were able to get that changed. But during my congressional testimony, I said there would be a need for medical devices that could address a broad spectrum of viral pathogens, and there would be a need for devices that could address the cytokine storm, as that's the leading cause of death in people with severe infections. Uh, fast forward to today, Segan therapy you know, performs both of those functions. Uh, it fulfills the broad spectrum countermeasure mandate of the U.S. government to address bioterror and pandemic threats, and simultaneous to that, it addresses the resulting cytokine storm. And a number of years ago, I had uh, the ability to regularly interact with Ken Alabeck, who at that time had just been named the, the co-head of the National Center of Biodefense, and Ken was the former head of the Soviet Union's bioterror program. It's called Biopreparat. It employed almost 30,000 researchers to develop uh, offensive biological weapons that could be potentially used against the United States and, and other enemies. Uh, and as Ken stated during the first International Crossing Boundaries Symposium, of which he was the keynote speaker, Extracorporeal blood purification is the only strategy to address the breadth of viruses that can emerge naturally through mother nature or be created by man as an agent of bioterror. And prior to the pandemic, I authored an article, Why the Nation Must Prepare for Future Pandemic Threats. And in this article, I, I discussed the futility of trying to attempt to develop antiviral drug agents uh, and this is specific to post-exposure therapeutics, not related to vaccine development. This is related to responding with a post-exposure therapy once somebody is infected, of which there's a tremendous futility to try to align an antiviral drug with each and every different threat, especially when you don't know what the threats are. And I pointed out in the article that it's only a fraction of the 300 human viruses that are known to be infectious man are addressed with an antiviral drug therapy. There's three to four new human viruses discovered each year. And I pointed out that global warming, encroachment on the environment and ease of worldwide travel will increasingly fuel new pandemics and that innovative broad spectrum device technologies will be required. And, and again, I keep moving on the theme that we can do things that are beyond the reach of drugs uh, and, and that are beyond the reach of previous blood purification technologies. And we've seen significant evidence of this in this image. And this is an image from my, my private collection. This is Dr. Stefan Butner, And he's holding, I mentioned earlier, I oversaw the development of the Athlon Hemopurifier, which was a, uh, a device with specificity uh, towards viral pathogens, rapid elimination of viral pathogens from blood. And during the Ebola outbreak in 2014, uh, a physician was caring for patients in Sierra Leone. He became infected himself, was life flighted to Frankfurt University Hospital in Germany, uh, where he was administered uh, the leading antiviral drug candidates, um, which 
he was not responsive to. And by day 11, we were brought in with the hemopurifier. At this point in time, the patient, the doctor had multiple organ failure uh, and was comatose. Uh, we treated the physician. We saw an immediate reduction of viral load. His, his kidneys started making urine. He made a full recovery and was eventually discharged from the hospital where he was able to return home to his, his wife and kids. So it, it's interesting to point out that in certain scenarios, especially where there's a need for a broad spectrum uh, mechanism of action, devices really can perform functions that are beyond the reach of drugs. And I'll point out that you know we were a small company, and yet our competition on the drug front was all of the leading pharmaceutical companies. Uh, so again, device strategies can be proven to be effective for these types of conditions. So what's next? We've been very busy over the course of the last year. Um, and we got a flurry of activity that, um, that we plan to leverage based on our recent accomplishments. Uh, completion of our animal studies, these are ongoing at University of Michigan. Uh, we completed our pilot studies. Uh, we wanna complete a collection of studies that we expect to complete by approximately year end uh, related to the treatment of uh, porcine models, these are 90 kilo or 40 kilo pigs, which are approximately 90 pounds, uh, complete these studies and then incorporate that resulting data with our collection of data to date in an investigational device exemption submission to FDA. This is related to our initiation of human studies in the United States. In combination with that filing, uh, we're preparing to uh, retain bankers uh, to complete a financing that gives us the ability to uplist to NASDAQ. This is something, uh, this is something I previously have experience in doing, uh, and we would ex expect this to happen not too long after the, the turn of the year, um, but that's very much a focal point. And then we'll also disclose the principal investigator and clinical site locations for our clinical site, for our clinical study, and initiation of our human clinical studies, our first in man studies. Uh, and along with this, we plan to submit a breakthrough device designation to FDA. This would be specific to hepatic encephalopathy. Uh, and this is something that I also have experience with. I've authored two breakthrough device designation submissions to FDA, of which both of them were awarded. And with that said, I, I thank you for your participation today. Uh, in your patience, and I will leave you with a depiction again of our product designed for the broad spectrum pathogen in cyt is a broad spectrum pathogen in cytokine storm countermeasure, and, and we'll leave you with my contact information. And Callie, with that, uh, if you want to open up the, the floor for questions, that'd be Abs great. Absolutely, yes. So um, the first question is, what kind of uh, immunotherapies has the potential to cause these cytokine storms? Okay, so Callie, the, um, the cytokine storm, I was referencing it today as something that's being induced by bacterial or viral infections, but in fact, the cytokine storm uh, can also be triggered by, by immunotherapies and cancer, CAR-T therapies, they can cause an excessive uh, immune response. And, and that was really for where it was first, I, I think, clinically defined. And, and it's been, the terminology has now been adapted to where uh, it's cytokine release syndrome when there's an adverse event to that type of uh, immunotherapy. And cytokine storm syndrome has become more of the terminology associated with a pathogen-induced event. Okay, great, thank you. And um, how big is the initial target market? Well, the uh, I mentioned the community acquired pneumonia um, and hepatic encephalopathy. These are uh, very significant markets. Uh, I mean, the the um, the the interesting thing with our device is that we can address. These unmet needs, they're not addressed. These are multi-billion dollar markets, but we can do it in a manner where, and, and this is extremely important, uh, especially when you think about being a public company and thinking about dilution. 
uh, we can leverage a feasibility study, which is a safety study, and bridge out of that safety study where we demonstrate the product is safe and well tolerated in health compromised patients. And in that study, it'll be hepatic encephalopathy patients, but then bridge out of that study in the pivotal studies, which is the study required for approval of your product, not just into a pivotal study for hepatic encephalopathy, but the intent is into a pivotal study for community acquired pneumonia, which is the number one cause of infectious disease deaths uh, worldwide. And it's, and it's deceptive because a lot of times you'll look at statistics of how many people die from sepsis or septic shock or ARDS. Well, that's what happens if, if you're not effective in addressing community acquired pneumonia early on, they, they merge into those conditions. And so somebody is coded for admission with community acquired pneumonia, but they also, they end up as a statistic if they unfortunately pass from the condition as having community acquired pneumonia, likely developed ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and then end up as a sepsis statistic as well. So it's, you know, this is, this is the cause for 50% of all sepsis cases worldwide. So very important and large unmet need in global health. Great, thank you. Um, how much will it cost you to get approval? Is there a battlefield application for this product? Yeah, the, the cost for approval, I, I can tell you this, the big, the big factor for us is to leverage our ability to quickly move into a feasibility study uh, we have tremendous confidence based on our previous experience that we can execute on the pivotal study, demonstrate our, that our technology is safe and well tolerated in a very health compromised patient population. And, and literally that is, that is something that uh, we can accomplish uh, you know, with less than $5 million, you know, if you wanna be specific on the dollar amount, and then be in a position where we can bridge into multiple large in, indications the, the challenge is we don't know the size of the pivotal study. We know that in our safety study, the feasibility study, it'll be a 10 to 15 subject study, and that's why it's so inexpensive. But when we bridge into uh, the pivotal study required for market clearance, uh, you know, that will be a negotiation with FDA. I can tell you historically with extracorporeal devices that went through CDRH, which is that's where our review team is, and I know them well, you generally see the patient populations being between 60 to 300 subjects, depending on the indication of which 50% are usually control subjects. Okay. And um, so when do you think the product will be available and are you open to partnerships and how would you imagine a partnership slash collaboration? Yeah, the, the, um, I don't like to predict uh, when the product is going to be approved in the marketplace. Um, you know, therapeutics going through FDA, I, I don't think any, any CEO should be predicting when his product's going to be uh, approved or available in the marketplace. We know what we need to do, uh, the execution process. Uh, we have experience in doing this, but, you know, it's not something we, we like to predict and, and, uh, and, and, you know, at this point in time, you know, won't, won't be doing that. Um, Callie, the second part of the question was- It was about um, how, how do you see partnership slash collaborations? How yeah, so that? a lot of our collaborations will be driven by, uh, be driven by uh, distribution agreements um, through people that already have established pathways into critical care, into the EU, I mean, into the uh, ICUs and hospitals, you know, and clinics worldwide. And then another player in the, in the grand scheme of things are the dialysis industry players uh, that run uh, or maintain the infrastructure of dialysis machines throughout clinics worldwide. And, 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 and they are a, uh, you know, a, a certainly a potential partner. I've you know, spent years interacting with those, uh, those organizations previously. But the, the objective is to execute clinically, get the product approved, into addressing large market indications uh, and demonstrate in controlled clinical studies that the device is effective. Uh, and in that demonstration, if we're successful, uh, you know, will probably, you know, lead to various partnerships or partnering opportunities 
But if you can navigate into uh, markets of the nature that we're talking about, uh, then you're a potential candidate. If you can demonstrate effectiveness, you're a candidate to be potentially acquired. Uh, and the one thing I'll point out in the medical device is people always think, well, the, you know, Fresenius are one of the dialysis players, they'll, they'll want to buy you. In reality, a device of this nature, and especially the way we designed this device, we designed it so that it can actually work in concert with drug therapies. And this is, this is critical because this can serve as an adjunct. It's not, it doesn't add any drug toxicity to a drug therapy. It has, can act as an adjunct to potentially improve the benefit of other drug therapies. And if we can demonstrate that we can improve the benefit of drug therapies, then we potentially open up the window uh, to have conversations with, with pharmaceutical companies. Thank you. Um, have you received any NIH or FDA grants for the research? No, we, we have not. Um, we, we knew when we filed our patents and designed our product, you know, we didn't look at this as a research project. We knew exactly how we were going to design it, used our previous experience. Uh, the designs that we envisioned have all worked out extremely well, and in some cases have performed some functions that weren't expected that have led to new intellectual property uh, submissions. But we really didn't need to do any early stage research. Uh, we moved directly into the development phase, the in vitro study phase, establishing the manufacturing protocols, and, and this has all worked out fine. So, you know, we haven't submitted for any types of you know, government support you know, related to early stage research, but we do uh, intend to pursue some of the programs that you know, we pursued previously on the contract side uh, related to the advancement of our product to treat certain potential indications where there might be support for clinical programs. Thank you. Um, are you using MABs in your device and also for vesicles? Yeah, the answer is no, we're not using antibodies. Uh, that would cause our product to be considered a combination product, which would move us outside of the scope of uh, CDRH at FDA uh, and would increase the challenge pretty dramatically. Uh, additionally, the use of monoclonal antibodies um, create certain challenges from a manufacturing perspective but not to say that that's not a good strategy if your target is a single target, or if you have a few different targets and you can incorporate a cocktail of different antibodies that are highly selective to those targets. But in our case, you know, we're talking about conditions that are really beyond the reach of single mechanism drugs because there's too many different targets. And you have to be able to address a very broad spectrum of targets in a very short period of time. So, you know, we don't, we didn't design our device with high levels of specificity like you would get from an antibody. We designed it to maximize the breadth of targets we could remove on a rapid real-time basis. Thank you. Um, do you expect to obtain off-label use of the product? Um, we expect to navigate, you know, clinical indications through FDA and, um, you know, there's very broad applications for use of this technology, but within the regulatory environment, we see the size of the markets uh, as being quite significant for the indications that we have interest in. And in terms of off-label, that's, that's, that's not a discussion for for us as a sponsor of clinical studies to discuss, that's a, you know, that's something for physicians to consider down the road once the product is already approved in the marketplace. Thank you. Um, you had lobbied Congress regarding issues of this sort. Uh, do you think the U.S. is ready for the next pandemic? No. No, I, 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 I can assure you, I have. Um, I think there's going to continue to be. Uh, the emergence of new pandemics. Um, I am extremely worried about new technologies. I mentioned Ken Alabeck. 
um, and, and the program they ran at the Soviet Union. Uh, today, there is research going on unsupervised around the world related to what's called gain and function, where research teams are uh, trying to increase the virulence of known pathogens to make them more infectious under the guise of being able to, um, to develop treatments or candidate treatments for emerging new pathogens. This is a very dangerous uh, form of research that's occurring around the world. Uh, additionally, with the evolution of CRISPR, um, the ability to genetically engineer uh, new pathogens, more virulent pathogens, uh, is, is now much more feasible. The, the Soviet Union didn't have such tools when they were trying to um, evolve uh, new threats. So it's, it's, you know, from a science standpoint, you know, the potential for emerging pandemic threats is is still very good, and, and they've been increasing at an increased rate over the last 20 years. Uh, and, you know, potential agents made by man, you know, now the capabilities to do that are, are very much real, and hopefully that doesn't come into play. Great, thank you. Um, and thank you so much for uh, presenting to us today and for everyone in the audience. Um, you all have my information. I can put you directly in touch with, with Jim. He, we left up his information. So hopefully you got that um, from there and uh, you can reach out to him directly as well. And I wanna thank everyone for joining today. And Jim, if you have any last words to the audience, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Kelly. And, and I appreciate you hosting today. And I thank everybody for participating in our presentation. And uh, again, as Callie mentioned, if you have any questions, please feel, feel free to reach out to us. Okay, thank you everyone and have a great day. Bye.